Oh, oh, come take my hand. We're riding out tonight to case the promised land. Oh, 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 Thunder Road. Oh, Thunder Road. Alright, so. That was majestic. I'm crying. I try, I try. Yeah, I cried more during this than the whole movie. I mean, the movie was kind of emotional, but that was. That was a lot. Yeah, that hit me right in the heart and in my uh, arteries, I think, too. And by the way, I'm going to be doing Bruce Springsteen for this whole episode. No, you're not. No, no. He won't. He definitely <laughs> no. won't. We can just cut out. Yeah, I was going to say, we'll entirely. cut you entirely. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't like Bruce Springsteen. It'll be really fun for the audience when you do the intro and then literally don't Never speak come the rest back. of the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so Thunder Road is the movie we are discussing today. Uh, Einish, I believe you have some details. Yeah, so um, some background. Jim Cummings, he made a short film, Thunder Road, in 2016, I believe. He made it for, like, really cheap, and I think, personally, it's, like, one of the best short films ever made. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's a one-take of, like, this man whose mother just passed away, and he's giving, like, a eulogy at her funeral, and it's emotional, it's funny, it's, it's just great. <laughs> Um, and then based off of that, then he wanted to make a feature length film on that like premise. So he started a Kickstarter and in 2018, Thunder Road was released with a budget of, I think, $200,000. And they came in under budget too. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. They came in under their $200,000 budget. So with a runtime of about 92 minutes. So no, yeah, that movie a... does not look like something that was made for like two hundred thousand well, dollars looks no, like something that was made I mean, we'll, with a... we'll, we'll talk about it but i mean it that's because they used their money smartly they didn't try and do some big budget picture they did a movie that plays to their strengths which is an actor yeah but i feel like there's so many movies which are like you know sort of like supposed to be a down-to-earth thing and they usually get about five million dollars and they look great but this movie looks like it cost about five to ten million dollars. Right. I think. Alex, the only the only thing I will use to make my argument is the fact that Joker's budget was fifty five million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm gonna yeah, say. But you keep in mind that's also a period piece. That like is this, actually a very fair, fair point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, there, there's only stuff in their there. houses. There's stuff in Joker where like it's like you know that the the ending riot you needed a budget to do that. Yeah, so. you need you needed a budget for a lot of Joker. There's a lot of special effects and stuff. This is pretty much. Are there a lot of special effects though? Like I'll give you I'll give you absolutely the the riot and I'll give you the fact that it's a period piece and you need like costumes and decorations and stuff. But effects. You mostly just need green screen. It's and then really plus you have to and then you have to have green screen. And you also have to pay for no, Joaquin no. Phoenix. And Todd Literally, Phillips. Those, those yeah, probably Todd Phillips' a massive ego budget. probably cost about $10 million all on its own. Not yeah. not to pay him, but just to contain him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, so there, there's a lot of money going down the drain there. But, like, I mean, this movie is just basic. You know, it, it, it's basically just, like, put him in someone's front lawn or sit him in a car outside of someone's house. And then have them act. <laughs> so, I mean... It's kind of... The, I also kind of like to describe Jim Cummings as, like, the polar opposite of Tommy Wiseau. Because, like, he directed this movie, wrote it, did the music, and, like, basically worked really hard on, like, trying to get it, like, produced and all of that. And so, like, he Actually basically... Succeeded. He had, like, auteur focus on this, essentially. Like, all aspects of its production. Except as a producer, funny enough, but... I mean, he's controlling everything else, so... And I, I'm assuming he actually had some hand in the production and stuff, so... Yeah, I mean, that's what he did before this. He was, uh, I think it was a line producer for, um... What was it? College Humor? Hmm. He was a line producer for College Humor or something. It was like College Humor, Funny or Die. And something he said, it's not really his kind of comedy. So he went on and made Thunder Road, which is... I mean, it is a comedy, but it's very much... A, it's it tries to be a lot more than that too it kind of I finds it, comedy in the less comedic aspects of life in a way i mm -hmm. think uh, it's more drama than it is comedy for sure like 
almost every movie I made so. nowadays for a big audience, which this film perhaps wasn't, but it is a well-made <laughs> film still. Well, it definitely was perhaps. not made for yeah. a big audience. I, I will say that almost every film, to some degree, utilizes humor nowadays, and that's normal. However, like, I do not think Thunder Road does it more than your average film. There's a lot of drama, though. Like, do we if you haven't seen a... this film, you will be crying. Do we want to give a summary of the movie? Yeah, so, I feel probably, like that's Einish's cue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, we... I could do it. <laughs> I mean the royal we. All right, fine. I'll I'll just do it. I'll give a basic premise. So, it's uh, the beginning of the movie is essentially the same as the short film, where um, the main character Jim, his mother passed away, so he's at the funeral giving a eulogy, and then. He um, gives this really awkward speech, and he decides, you know what, I'm going to do this little song and dance thing to Thunder Road because it was really important to his mother, and that's what inspired her to like leave her hometown and all of that, so it strikes a chord with him. But after that, then, <laughs> it basically goes off on its own plot, where Jim is having to deal with a rough divorce with his wife. He's trying to fight a custody battle to with his um wife for their daughter, Crystal, and... Also dealing with the um, the difficulties that come with his job as a police officer. And that's, yeah, that's essentially the whole movie. That's pretty well summarized. Mm -hmm. All right, are we going to do intro statements? Yeah, sure. Guys, though, I have a brilliant idea for, it's kind of a drama, kind of a comedy based on the song Sam's Town. Now, hold, stay with me. No, no. <laughs> His father dies. <laughs> and that's it. Huh? So yeah, intro statements. You are the death of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, intro statements. Um, <laughs> intro statements, oh I, I really... I, I missed what you said. What did you say? I said that you are the death of humor. Uh, <laughs> I try. <laughs> um... Yeah, no, I it, I assume that means I'm killing it. Uh, that was actually rather pretty solid that, 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 that was actually pretty good. <laughs> that got me. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so my thoughts on the film, I really like it. Uh, the guy has a really distinct style of performance, and I, I remember thinking while I was watching it, um, like, did he write this himself? Because I didn't really n look up any of the stuff beforehand, but I was just look watching it going okay he a hundred percent wrote this himself the main actor because i'm like nobody like to you have to know exactly how the actor is going to pull it off in order to write the style of performance he does where it's like hitting the on off switch on emotions constantly where it's like you know he'll be breaking down crying and then like he'll switch and he'll go oh the boom box should we call the warranty should we call the manufacturer <laughs> and then flip back to like like breaking down crying in front of everyone <laughs> like it, it's it reminds me in a way of uh, the movie Lobster in that it's just like there is such an individualistic uh, voice to the writer that you're like uh, either every so everyone that sees it is either going to be like this is really well done and a really good movie or they're going to be like what is this shit you're making me watch? <laughs> All right, um, I'll go. I absolutely adore this film. I remember when we watched. Uh, Alex wasn't with us that time. He watched the movie last night. But uh, I Andrew, yeah, <laughs> I believe that. Andrew Einish and I watched that movie like in in the same room, and I remember that I don't think we paused the movie or really talked during the movie at all. And then it was over and we sat there for like a solid five minutes just taking it all in. And this this is definitely a piece of something special. This is absolutely art. And I guess on the subject of uh, low budget movies as a whole, I will say kind of the same thing that, that Alex did about how it's always very much taking a risk because you, you don't know whether or not you're going to get Thunder Road or The Room. Those both, of course, being very extreme versions of success and failure. <laughs> In that order, no. Uh, 
I don't know that many low budget films myself, but I I will talk about the few ones that I know today later in this podcast and yeah, I really appreciate when when these things succeed because the industry is really stacked against it currently. Andrew Dinish, one of your takes. Okay, I uh yeah, I suppose <laughs> I can go. Yeah. Um yeah, this movie's awesome. It's really, really good. Um, it really is one of those films where if it wasn't made by such an auteur, it probably wouldn't work that well just because of the balance of drama and comedy is something that's really, really hard to do. And only the people who would know exactly what they want are able to get it. Um, an example I think of is um, like Dr. Strangelove, which... Uh, for those who don't know, is a comedy about the nuclear holocaust, which sounds like just about the worst idea ever. Um, but because Kubrick was writer and director and one of the most meticulous and demanding people to ever work in the film industry, everything comes off exactly the way he wants it, and it works absolutely brilliantly. And Thunder Road's a lot the same way. Even like this the fact that Jim Cummings knows so much about every different aspect of film helps a lot too. Like just reading here, he was writer, director, producer. He was the main actor. Of course, it's based on his prior short film. He did the music and he, he was a co-editor and he was the visual effects artist. And if I'm not mistaken, he helped with the sound design as well. Um, the man knows how to do everything and does do everything. And like... A lot of times you can kind of tell when a filmmaker is like only good at like one specific thing. Like, for example, like I and I talk a lot about Tom Hooper, who made <laughs> Les Mis and Danish Girl and uh, Cats and The King's Speech. Um, man's a bad director, but th three of those four films won acting Oscars. So like the man like clearly understands how to get a good performance. He just can't do anything else. Um, Jim Cummings is the kind of guy who can do everything. And Thunder Road is like a pristine example of that. Yeah. I, I share a lot of the same thoughts as Oleg and Andrew on this movie. This is one of my favorite movies, I think, ever. I, I really respect the movie a lot for having such a low budget, but also it just it looks very professional. And the two aspects that really shine the most, I think, are the cinematography and the editing. It's edited <laughs> really well. Like, it's 92 minutes, but it doesn't... It's weird because it doesn't feel short, but it doesn't feel long either. Like, it, it just feels... It feels like you've watched something of, like, great magnitude kind of a thing. Where it's just like, wow, that, that hit me. But you also just didn't notice, like, the movie go by also because it's just paced so well. And the cinematography, where I feel like a lot of low budget movies, this that part of the, like the movie tends to not look great. And there are like one or two scenes in this movie where it's kind of like, okay, you can kind of tell this isn't like the best camera quality, or it's a little shaky. But I think the cinematography is honestly fantastic. Maybe even like best of the year, <laughs> that year that it came out, twenty eighteen. I. Uh, one scene that really in particular just comes to mind is um, it's near the near the beginning of the third act and Jim Cummings just at home and his friend comes over and they just kind of hang out for a day. That whole bit is just shot so well. There's a lot of like handheld, but it's also just done so well and something that's rarely done is well done handheld cam. So it's really good handheld. It's really good. It's just very personal and the way it's edited with the music, it's it's great. I also agree this movie would not work if Jim Cummings wasn't involved in basically everything. <laughs> but I also respect the fact that it doesn't feel like this movie where the, he's kind of like, hey, I'm just going to show off how great I am because I want you guys to praise me. It seems like the kind of movie where he had the passion for it and he just wanted to make and tell a really great story and movie. So, yeah, and That's a really great point, too, about, like, the fact that despite the fact that Jim Cummings is like basically slowly becoming like the new generation of James Cameron of like the like directors who literally can do everything and also will frequently do everything. Um, 
he's got this great humility about him. Like, I'm not sure um, about you guys, but, like, I posted my review of Thunder Road onto Letterboxd, like, a social media site for film reviewers, and he liked it. He, yeah, he liked yeah. mine also. He liked, he <laughs> liked our reviews of his film. Like, <laughs> this, is a, this is a very, like, this is a man who's, like, operating on a very small scale and, like, is reaching out to express gratitude for random people giving reviews to his movie on a site where he frequently gives reviews. He only gives reviews that don't have stars and are very high praising or five star reviews where he's very praising. I was going to he say, he just I seems like a really he, cool guy. I wonder if he'd leave a like on, on one that's less than five stars or fewer than five stars. Well, he left a like on mine. And that was fewer than five stars, so there you go. Oh, okay. He leaves a like on most all reviews for his movie, I think. At least from what I've seen. Yeah, he definitely seems like the kind of guy who would be open to criticism. Um, Like, even if you, like, read some of his, like, stuff, he just kind of talks about, like, yeah, I'm just trying to learn everything. Like, he's very understanding that he doesn't know everything yet, which I find respectable because it seems like he knows a lot more than just about everybody else. So. I will say, I, I think I think going forward, it's going to be very difficult for him to make another film because I think... Thunder Road already, like, creates a precedent? Well, there's that, and then it's, there's also... He has this really distinctive voice that worked really well for this specific character and for this specific story, right? So it worked really well for this kind of cop character who's trying to keep his stuff together and not fall apart in front of everybody Um, and who's, like, emotionally stunted and who's, like, in the middle of this, you know, big, like, horrible change in his life type thing, you know, where everything is falling apart. But, I mean... The, so the options are either A, you know, completely change his style, which could totally mess things up for another film, or B, uh, make essentially the same movie, which would also suck. I think I think I I, I kind of agree in part where it's like he's this movie is fantastic, and trying to make a movie better than this would be very difficult. However, I disagree and think, like, I do think that his style and just general way that he makes a movie could work very well for other projects. Like, I think currently he's working on, like, a horror film. Yeah, he's making a werewolf movie. So, um, that actually sounds really interesting. At the very I least, it would be well-directed and well-shot and all of that. I, I, I wonder whether, like, in this he, film... He's, he's going to have to change um, his style if he's doing... Sorry, he's going to have to change his style if he's doing a horror movie. Because there's, there's well, of no course, because there's voice. the the yeah. cinematography and just the genre, like the parts yeah. of your direction that correlate to genre will of course not be the same between a comedy drama film and well, no, I mean, a even, horror film. Even his writing, like he has a very distinct voice when writing. And I mean, granted, I've only seen the one thing of his because there, there is I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying that of course it's going to be different. But like that's that's just what different genres are. You don't write for them in the same way. Uh, I guess that's true and also uh, it's going to be another it's going to be another cop story so it seems like he'll be sort of using the yeah, so that sort of, of po- police aspect what I was going to it. say so. can I? Um, I was yeah. going to ask because I don't know whether um, anything that is present in Thunder Road actually correlates with his life history because it seems like a passion project and I was wondering like, if something comes from within there I'm not sure, actually. He's from the he is from the heartland. I know that, um, but that's I hate about you all for I know. Using the phrase "the heartland." Ugh. Okay, well, you know, <laughs> it's it's a fair phrase to use. He's from the soul of America. Yeah. Well, tech, I mean, I actually, yeah. this movie's the only reason. I, the only reason I used immersed in that kind of world. As I say, the only reason I use the word heartland is because I feel like there's a connotation to that. That's a bit different than just saying the Midwest or the Bayou, you know, it's sort of like somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a very Bruce Springsteen f- phrase, but you know, 
Yeah. Also, to, to, to use it so casually makes me hate you on some level. <laughs> well, you kind of hated me already, so. Yeah, that's true. No. <laughs> we all hate each other. Yeah. Yeah. Trust that's me, we do. That makes it work. That, yeah, that, it slight, that slight middling contempt we all have for each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to look up to see if there's anything on the backstory yeah that's the one that's the one problem with these uh, micro budget movies is that there is basically no information on these people uh <laughs> you have to dig pretty deep to find anything whatsoever I'm, I'm willing to bet that he was uh or he had some involvement with police like maybe his dad was a police officer or some such yeah i mean like, i would if he have wasn't. yeah i'd have to think so if only because like it just, it really feels like, because he, he wrote it very quickly, that much I know, mm. um, and, like, I also, like, very recently wrote a feature-length screenplay that's a police procedural, and it takes a lot of research. Like, you have to know a lot of stuff in order to get that down, so for him to write it so quickly, he has to have had, like, some knowledge of it going into it. Well, I mean, like, it's not like he gets too involved in the actual procedural stuff of it. It's not like he's like, you know, well, and then I, you have to file the, you know, W-94 form to, you know. It, it, yeah. But he's like, I feel like he has an inside track on the kind of emotional weight of certain things. Yeah, and, like, for me, it's sort of, like, when I watched Marriage Story, like, I, one of the things that impressed me about because my dad is a, my dad is a uh, family lawyer and does a lot of divorce and custody stuff, mm -hmm. and so, for me, one of the things I loved about Marriage Story was just that it felt like it really understood that world. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, when uh, Laura Dern and, um, who is, who is it, Ray Liotta, when they uh, first meet each other, they're, like, very nice, and they, like, ask how, like, each other's families are doing, and then they get into the courtroom, and they, like, tear each other to shreds, and, like, everyone I talked to thought that, like, they were just doing that because it's, like, a natural, like, it's just, like, a nice thing to do when you work, but they actually hate each other, and, like, having a lawyer for a father, I know that's just not the case. Lawyers tend to, like, go at each other's throats in the courtroom and be best friends outside of the courtroom, and that's just how the job works yeah exactly yeah and so like thunder road feels like it has a very similar thing where like it understands how like it how things work emotionally within the station and how the job impacts people on a more personal level mm -hmm. which is really helpful i think <laughs> here i would like to ask the question for the sake of this discussion, what are we recognizing as a low budget film? Is it like below a million dollars, below five million dollars? I feel like a million is high. <laughs> I'm gonna say I'm on I'm on Relatively. Wikipedia right now looking at stuff, and so um, they define micro budget films as um, they don't really have a definition for like micro budget, but generally it's like below like half a million dollars. Um, Oh, in that case, um, yeah. I, have, I have a good, I have a good budget for a movie. I was gonna say, so I've got, I've got a few examples of like famous low budget films here. So, um, The Way of the Dragon and Enter the Dragon. Um, Way of the Dragon was hundred thirty thousand. Enter the Dragon was eight hundred fifty thousand. Um, the most famous example, of course, being the Blair Witch Project, where it was only sixty thousand dollars to make. They literally returned their camera cameras back to Radio Shack when they finished filming. And then it made almost $250 million worldwide. Um, Paranormal Activity was made for $15,000 and it spawned an entire franchise. A lot of horror movies. Yeah, Halloween was made for three twenty-five dollars and <clears throat> that Evil made Dead. 70. Yeah, Evil yeah, Dead. Yeah, Evil Dead. Yeah, Evil Dead well, took three years to make because they had to go On the other hand, it's not exactly a fair argument because that was like in the 1980s. And I don't know whether or not that is going to hold as... A micro budget when you adjust for inflation. No, yeah, even with inflation, it's micro budget. Yeah, yeah. I was, yeah. What I was reading up on the hundred thousand. I was reading they, up they on the production, and it's yeah, ridiculous. they literally went door to door. Yeah, they went door to door yeah. asking for donations. So that by the could... end of production, um, I was I had to write a paper on Evil Dead, and by the end of the production, the cast and crew were burning furniture inside the house to keep warm because they couldn't <laughs> afford heating. <laughs> 
Okay, yeah, actually, whether or not that's going to end up more or less than 500000 I will I will accept that as a sign, sign of it being low budget. Yeah, like Halloween was 325000 budget, so like uh, 1978, like that would probably be somewhat close to a million would be my guess. I'm not very good at math, so someone can check me on that. But like, I mean, this was a thing where they had to make it look like fall, and they did a really good job. It looks like fall, even though it's shot in spring in California. It Wait, looks really? like fall in Illinois. I thought and it was shot in the fall. No, it was, shot, it was shot in the spring in California, and it looks like fall in Illinois. One of the ways they did that was they had leaves blowing across the screen. Well, they only had one bag of leaves, so they would blow <laughs> the leaves across the screen, and then they would pause, and everyone would run out with their rakes, like director, actors, everyone, and like scrape them back into the bag so they could use it for the next scene. <laughs> So, like, that's a classic sign of, like, a micro-budget film. Like, these people clearly, even though they had some money, they clearly just did not have, like, resources. Yeah. Man, this caught me off off, uh, off guard that, uh, you know, the movie The Lobster, where it, it feels like it it's pretty basic, um, but four million. Wow. Yeah. I mean, granted, yeah. it, it's also starring, you know, Colin Farrell, so... Do you like think that's where talking, all the budget went? Uh, I'd say a good majority went to fielding the high fidelity cast. Is like, let's look at some of the actors here, actors and actresses. You have Colin Farrell, uh, Rachel Wise, uh, Olivia Coleman, uh, Jessica Barden, Lea Seydoux. It, oh yeah, that, those a, are some decent high, names. Yeah. yeah. I think it's also fair when thinking of low budget movies to think like in like perspective of the film sort of a thing where like yeah this thing may have cost five million but like for what they did and all of that like it looks like a 50 million dollar movie sort of a thing it's like movies that just have a way smaller budget than what you'd expect yeah sort of like how like Deadpool was not made for a small amount of money but like for all the stuff they had to do in that film like they were definitely like barely scraping by by the time things were over the uh, director I think uh, later on in interviews he talked about how like he would edit the movie for free like just on Adobe Premiere Pro yeah <laughs> because like they couldn't like editors like you know work nine to five so afterward he would just go in and work on it yeah yeah if if we're talking about low budget films in the sense that not necessarily budget below five hundred thousand but they achieve way more with the budget than you would expect then we cannot avoid mentioning a twenty four as a film studio because that's oh, literally yeah. what they do <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Like because um, people like ex they like have this weird way of like calculating like the exact amount of money that people will need and keeping it under yeah. fifteen mil and giving uh, it to them. The the witch and the lighthouse were both four million dollars. Then wow. I, th yeah, I know, right? No, no, I, I was going to say uh, I'm saying wow at uh, Nolan's first film, uh, following. Six thousand. Oh no! Yeah, following is ridiculous. Well, no. Here, here's the fun fact on that. Following was filmed on a budget of uh, three thousand, and then the other three thousand was what it cost to blow it up to thirty five millimeter film for distribution. <laughs> wow, so it literally great. cost the exact same that amount of money cheap. to blow it up to thirty five millimeter film as it did to make the whole friggin' thing. I remember oh, I was reading up on the okay. production of it, and uh, I think Nolan was talking about how they didn't have like a lot of film because they shot it on film they didn't have a lot of it so they would just meticulously rehearse scenes over and over and over so that at most it would take two takes you know that reminds me of uh for one of the david bowie songs uh they ran out of tracks to record uh like his like backup vocals and stuff so they needed echoing so normally you just kind of you record it onto multiple tracks and you play them slightly offset or you record it multiple times but since they only had one track left uh they just set up another microphone uh really far away so that they would pick up his voice like slight delay <laughs> so and then they recorded both the main vocal and the the like echo vocal onto the one track I thought, I'm like, Legendary. it's one of those things where it's like, that seems actually very obvious, but it's like, I never would have thought to do that. <laughs> what a what a strange thing to do. <laughs> okay, fun fact. Uh, here is the, I've just found the lowest budgeted film ever to make over a million dollars at the box office. 
And it was, of course, a Robert Rodriguez movie. Oh, Pirates 4. Oh, yep. Um, <laughs> That's still done? Yep, it was Spy Kids 2, no, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> which had no money whatsoever. Um, actually, pretty good movie, too. Um, I believe that. Yeah, Robert Rodriguez made a movie called El Mariachi, which was made for $7,000. They didn't have the money to do second takes because it was (laughs) $7,000. El Mariachi was so fucking good, though. That's the thing. Everyone loves it. He was writer, director, producer. Um, He did the cinematography and the editing. Robert Rodriguez is like the ultimate man when it comes to like the ultimate director. Yeah, Robert Rodriguez is interesting thing because the like, ultimate man the ultimate lo- man yeah. yeah no honestly a lot of auteurs really like they take charge of almost every aspect of production but even when robert rodriguez is dealing with a six or seven figure budget he's like nah f it i'll still do it myself <laughs> just <laughs> you, you all on what, my own you know what we we missed uh um, what the obvious one blair witch no, oh, I mentioned that. Andrew Don't mentioned worry. Blair Witch. Did he? Did he mention Blair Witch? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it's really like a popular thing for. I, I'm not gonna say popular, but a, a more common thing for horror movies to be low budget. Like all of those found footage films, like Paranormal Activity, Blair Witch, yeah. which inspired the Jason it. Blum movies. Yeah, like to, uh, <laughs> Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like Halloween, Evil Dead, all of those below five hundred thousand. Oh, yeah. Saw. Saw's the other obvious one. I think oh, yeah. so, yeah. I'm not sure. That's true. Oh, I, I want to bring up... No, it looks the part. <laughs> well, the Saw short film was made for, like, basically nothing. I think the feature had a bit more money, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it wasn't the feature a had, ton, like, 1.2 sure. mil. Yeah. Which, in fairness, considering the production design of Saw, again, that's it's not a lot of to money. Keep it down. Yeah. Yeah, that, the production design for Saw is um, pretty elaborate, so definitely would have uh, would have needed to use that. Have you guys um have you guys seen Brick by Ryan Johnson? I haven't. Uh, I've heard a lot of adver- advertisements for the movie from you, however <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. It's it's my favorite or second favorite Ryan Johnson film. Uh, probably favorite actually the more I think about it, but it's made for a budget of about $450,000. It made like 4 million, but I was reading up on the production, and, like, apparently he wrote it, like, a year after graduating from USC, and he was pitching the movie for seven years, and nobody, nobody was, like, letting him take it, because they're like, you're a first-time director, why would we let you make this movie? It's too weird. It's, like, a film noir set in high school. <laughs> like, that's just strange. So, Johnson, on his own, calculated how much money he would make, like, how much money he would need to make this movie, like, the minimum amount to, like, get this off the ground and like do it then he went around asking friends family like all of that and then made the movie and they shot it in 20 days and this yeah, is also sorry. the movie that put joseph gordon levitt like on the map i think but, like he was yeah. pretty big as a child actor and stuff but like this one it's like oh this dude can act i, I just want to point out that um the original mad max let me let me pull up the budget again real quick Hold on. Oh yeah, the, geez, this one is <laughs> nuts. Yeah. The original Mad Max was made on three hundred thousand. Yeah, that is insane. very cheap. He had to destroy and his own car. It made three hundred and seven. <laughs> it made three hundred and seventy-eight point nine million. Yeah. Worldwide. You see the yeah that yeah, Volkswagen no, the, that gets destroyed in that amazing it. opening very good chase is just his car. Yeah. Just absolutely He's, wrecks his own vehicle it, it apparently for a while held the guinness world record for the most profitable film <laughs> blair witch i think superseded that right um possibly blair witch is so overrated in my opinion i but I'm not i guess that's not a conversation for today yeah, I, I would i, I would fight you on it. that but if we can get to that from what it day. did i guess I was, yeah i was i was going to say um that's my yeah. point goes before that because i was talking about ryan johnson and like brick Mm -hmm. in particular because nowadays a lot of people um i'm not gonna say take ryan johnson for granted necessarily but a lot of people shit on him after the last jedi and even as somebody who likes the movie i will say a lot of those aspects are somewhat justified like he didn't do a good job of with all of it but he needs to get more respect as an auteur like he always has a vision and he knows how to execute it I also like think he's, like, he's the type of director who knows how to make what, what he wants. I, I think he shouldn't write, though. 
No, he, he wrote. He shouldn't write no, 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 watch Brick. He wrote dude. Knives Out. He wrote Knives Out okay, and Brick, well, and both are fantastic. In, in fairness, the only thing I've seen of his is Last Jedi, and that's enough for me. Well, and I think yeah, it's, it's compared. At least I will say, compared to the other sequel trilogy movies, it's the only one that's actually well written. Yeah, okay. I agree with that. I, I will give you that it's probably better. I mean, it's definitely better than uh, Rise of Skywalker, Duh. obviously. Um, mm-hmm. it, it is better than The Force Awakens, with all due respect. Eh, I eh. don't think so. I, I, even, I if you don't like, if, even if you like it less as a movie, which like, not, we've no, had a big I don't think it's better written, I can accept though, that. Either. No, I it's definitely better, better written. written. We, we had Star Wars discussion. is not low budget filmmaking, so can we uh, can we steer? Yeah, back? we've had this discussion. Let's... <laughs> but um, <laughs> I actually I, I kind of want to talk story. about Ryan Johnson a little bit, just because no. I no no like I I think that the man doesn't get enough credit for like just how how much he knows about film or like just how well he executes on that also. Like I think Brick, obviously, it's very low budget, but it's it's shot so well. There's this great chase scene in the high school where like Joseph Gordon Levitt's character has to run away from like an onlooker and no no wow he has to, he has to run away from like a bully or something and the the camera motions I I can't even like explain it but like you get these like it almost looks like a steady cam or like one of those things where they lay down a track and then the camera just like goes really fast from left to right. But they clearly did not have the budget for that. But it looks almost exactly like that. Yeah, I've seen. I've seen what he's talking about. It's very, very impressive what they're able to pull off with like no. basically no like cinematography technology whatsoever. Have, uh, also, uh, Ryan Johnson. Like in fairness, he is like I. I would say that like if you look at everything he's done, my guess is he's probably more of a quantity over quality sort of guy at least for most of his career, as he was building up. But the man also made over 90 short films before he graduated college. Like That is, wow. Really? He, also, he, cle- he, clear- he clearly has a passion for it, and like you can't make 90 short films and not be like somewhat good. Also, yeah, the, um, the three so, episodes of... Oh, can, I, can I just finish this one thought? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I love I'm Ryan sorry. Johnson. The uh, three episodes of Breaking Bad that he directed are... Um, in my opinion, oh, the fly. Um, yeah, <laughs> I actually really like fly, but I was talking. I more love of a... the fly, dude. Wait, wait, wait. He... Which fly? What are you talking the about? Episode? The, the episode. The fly. episode on Breaking oh. Bad. I hate it. I really. Of hate course it. you do. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it you sucks. Do. No, it's no, it great. really doesn't. <laughs> I but literally no. I skipped that episode again. Okay, well, because, wow. Like, I'm, I'm sure. Like, it... What I was gonna say, if you can't you can't say something sucks if you didn't watch. I'm on my rewatch. No, it was so bad on my first one that it stuck with me for ten years. And no, I said, Fly not is watching. fantastic. It oh, is. No, one second. The movie's good. No, the Fly is great. Wait, the are episode... you talking about the movie with Jeff Goldblum? <laughs> no, no, no. That's Grant, that's Cronenberg. I fucking love that. No, the episode with uh, from Breaking Bad, it sucks. It's awful. No, but you like the Jeff Goldblum one over Fly. <laughs> Okay, the, the Joe Goldblum fly movie, the fly movie. Oh, it's sucks. funny. It's funny. It's I mean, really it's funny it's kind of funny, but it's not good. The, the Cronenberg one? I think it's pretty good, actually. It's like, Cronenberg. It's not great, I fucking but it's actually love it. pretty good. It's yeah. like it's kind of campy and funny. Like I enjoy it, but like, but I, I want to. I mean, boring. I wouldn't refuse watching the, it. But the episode. Like, it's not. It's not exactly a masterpiece. You know what I'm saying? No, the episode of Breaking Bad that I really, really love, which I think oftentimes just gets spoken about as being like the best episode of television, possibly, is Ozymandias, the third to last episode, which, Mm -hmm. don't spoil because I guess Andrew Uh hasn't seen it, but, oh, like you've seen it, right? Yeah, for sure. And I, it's, and it's, (laughs) it's fantastic. It's so good. Like, I, I'm blown away by that episode every time I see it. Like, it's just... (laughs) It's so good. Like I, I don't know what to say about it other than just it's fantastic and yeah. All it three is. of his epi- all is. three of his episodes that he's made for Breaking Bad are are amongst just like the best of. I the think show. they are like the best Breaking Bad episodes. Okay. I I would like to point out though that um, the if you look up the fly the the cast uh, that comes up on Google, the top billed cast are one Jeff Goldblum obviously as Seth Brundle. And two, David Cronenberg as gynecologist. Why is he number two? Wasn't um, <laughs> what's her what's her name? No, 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 David Cronenberg. No, Gina no. Davis. Yeah, Gina Davis is a pretty big actress. Why is yeah, she she's not a, second? She's number three. 
She's number three yeah, with Veronica. Be, before place. we move on onto the fly, I want to uh, shill for Ryan Johnson a little more. That's what I was going to say. Um, after he released Knives Out, he made a podcast about filmmaking, pretty much, and about how he made Knives Out. It's accessible. And I think it's just a really interesting insight into filmmaking. And admittedly, like, once again, it's a little off topic because it's more about filmmaking in general than it is about low budget movie film, like filmmaking. But like the man is an auteur, and he has he has the theory to back it up. I'll, I'll give him um, that he's really good with camera work, and he's really good with achieving really just stupendous visuals. I just don't think his writing is good. I mean, you've only which seen is, one once again. You've only him. seen the Last Jedi, <laughs> Wait, and which apparently is the Fly, de- which is definitely. <laughs> I don't. The, the Last Jedi so. is easily his worst script, like easily, and I I like the script, but it's easily his weakest. So like I, I don't feel it's fair to judge him on his worst. I'll try script. watching. I'll try watching Knives Out, but man, it, there's it's just a good movie. Like you, I don't think you, I don't think even you won't enjoy it. I'll put it like that. It's legitimately just a fun ride. Here, here's one. Uh, have you guys seen the movie Pie? No. Nope. By D- Darren Aronofsky. The, oh, no, American Pie. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> this is the Aronofsky. I know the director. Movie, moron. Yeah, I definitely know the director. So. Pie was his first one <laughs> that I fucking loved. American Pie. <laughs> well, okay, so this movie Pie is basically about a mathematician who becomes obsessed with like this, n- the number of God essentially, um, and its budget was sixty thousand dollars. It's so fucking good. It it made. I mean, I guess it made relatively low. It's three point two million dollars, but I mean, it was. It's one of the best films ever, I think. Uh, Darren, Ar- I haven't seen Pi. I will admit, maybe it's good, but Darren Aronofsky in general is kind of not my cup of tea. I've seen um, Requiem. Uh, Requiem for a Dream, of course. I've seen Black Swan, and I've seen Beautiful Mother. Mind. Wait, you haven't seen Beautiful Mind? No, I have not. What? Oh my God! You need to. Okay, you need to watch but that. But those three, those three. Oh, never were mind. All that was Ron Howard. My mistake. But Beautiful Mind. Oh, <laughs> dude, don't get me started on that one. I fucking love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, either way, those three um, Darren Aronofsky yeah. movies: yeah. Black Swan, Wrecking for a Dream, and Mother. Uh, didn't really like those. Thought they Wrecking were for a little... Dream is amazing. Yeah, Wrecking, Wrecking for, for a Dream, dream movie's unreal, is good, dude. dude. Okay, I will say it is good. It's just really not my cup of tea. Yeah, I mean it's it's not a cup. It's not pretty much anyone's uh, cup of tea. It's a cup it's of just bleach. So Let well me put made. it like that. Yeah, I, I mean, mean it's, it's it meant a... to make you. It's basically meant to make you depressed and unhappy. But it's really, really good at it. Yeah, that's why I love it. <laughs> yeah, so, kind of same. Not gonna lie. I love. I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, real quick, I love how uh, he gathered money to shoot pie. Um, he financed it from a hundred dollar donations from friends and family and he said for everyone who gave him a hundred dollars he'll give them a hundred and fifty dollars back <laughs> I'm, what a chat. I'm like that's actually a smart move but <laughs> and then he said and if the movie flops you'll at least get screen credit <laughs> what a unit what a unit <laughs> love that no, that's actually pretty yeah. fair i mean you lose a hundred bucks or you get 150 and it's like i mean if you can yeah. afford it, that's not bad. Yeah, I mean, yeah, mm-hmm. that's yeah, that's even even on minimum wage, that's not too many hours of work, so it's not too bad. Um, but kind of going back to more like low budget stuff, I just kind of brings up an interesting question because like a lot of the people we've talked about have all gone on to be like very auteur. So mm-hmm. like, by do you guys think that by nature low budget production where you kind of have to do everything makes you an auteur for that film or not uh i, I in think many cases yeah it kind of yeah do that. I, I i'm not sure about this one i i think it's because a lot of low budget movies start out like the good ones that end up launching people's careers are usually passion projects right it, it's it's very seldom that you see someone make a low budget movie that they're like, eh, you know, someone came with a script and I said, eh, I guess I'll make it for you. You know, like it, it's usually someone cares deeply about making the movie. And it's also so, fair to fair to say though that like I feel like out of ninety nine out of a hundred of these passion projects are bad typically. Yeah. 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 Exactly. You can yeah. you can be an auteur in a bad film. 
like Tommy Wiseau, is absolutely an auteur. <laughs> or yeah. student films. Yeah, Michael Bay is an auteur, and he sucks. And I also think that you can be an auteur for one film, and then another film you take a completely different approach, and you're not an auteur for that film. Because, right. like, it, it, I guess, like Alex <laughs> said, the approaches can be too different for you to just quantify somebody, like a pop culture director who only makes, like, big money films. And then you classify them as an auteur for for a small film they made. Like in in an, in a future upcoming podcast of ours, we'll talk about Christopher Nolan, and like absolutely, yeah. He when was Tenet not, comes out eventually, like you could kind of Someday. call him an auteur even on his later films. But like I I do not dare call him an auteur for say Interstellar, Memento, why or not? I guess no, the following. Yeah, why wouldn't you? He's definitely not touring Interstellar. It's yeah, just I was gonna not say, a great movie. why it's why? like. Yeah. Why would you not I, consider him that? Like I, I have I have a different word for him for Interstellar, but it's less kind. Okay, but like I mean, why, I will, why I will would say you not we shouldn't consider judge him the... harshly because we dislike the film, but uh, because I, as I said, you can't be an auteur on something that is that you don't like. That that that's fair. Yeah, he but like, how is he? How is he not an auteur in Interstellar? Like, I don't get. That. I think when your project gets enough big money where you have to delegate enough, you kind of lose that unique and unanimous voice you have in your mm-hmm. film. And with a project of Interstellar's magnitude, that was pretty much unavoidable. I mean, I think the same for like Inception, where I, I, it's still I, yeah. it's still very much his voice, but it's like it's still popcorn. You know, well, like, about I, Dark I wouldn't Knight. even call him an auteur for Dark Knight. Absolutely. Dunkirk. I, no, I Dark, he, he would... can't possibly be an auteur for Dark Knight if he's not an auteur for Inception. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, well, yeah. I mean, I, I can get into this. I'm going to try and do a side series on this. But, like, <laughs> personally, I kind of think the whole auteur theory is kind of, like, I like the idea of it. I really do. And I like a lot of, like, auteur works. I just find them more interesting than studio stuff. That's just personal taste. But... I mean, the production of Justice League is pretty amazing to read up on. So, yeah, Anyways, well, I mean, it, um, it's the idea of like <laughs> it, it, it's the voice. It's because it, it's like when you're reading a book, you want to hear an author's voice. You don't want a write by committee thing. Yeah, well, my my idea on the auteur theory is that the whole thing's kind of BS. Just because like film is a group thing, like you cannot make like. Unless it is, like, one person sitting at a table, which I know there's a documentary about that that everyone seems to really like. Um, but unless that's it, like, you need a, you need at least some people in order to make a film. So it's not, it's not like music, you know? You can't, it's not like you can write it and make it all your own, like Bonnie Vare or something like that. And it's not like poetry or a novel where it is only you. Like, there's a lot of involvement, so it can't really be your voice no matter well, yeah, what yeah but not everybody will have creative influence over the project some people yeah. will just you know do a job yeah, like that's I mean, why that's... i feel like auteurs are more likely to uh appear in low budget films because you just have to do more stuff yourself like you have to be responsible for let's say what music you're gonna put in you're gonna have to be responsible for writing the film you're gonna have to be responsible for um the like the filmmaking aspects of it i guess the cinematography and that just like allows your voice to shine through more because due to circumstances there is nothing like in the way to muddle the message that's true but like let's think about like would you consider 2001 to be an auteur film yes that is a good thing i i feel like i would to be because that is a massive budget yeah i feel like there are exceptions again like yeah. we're saying generally this generally that but i feel like there are exceptions yeah and that's that I mean, another thing about the auteur stanley kubrick has never given of... up control over anything he's ever done yeah stanley no. kubrick has such a loud voice then good luck to anybody trying to add something of their own to his <laughs> yeah. project yeah you try to put up like some sort of sound blocker and you just get knocked right on your ass yeah like, basically <laughs> no one could stop kubrick um, I think few people can stop Nolan. In all frankness, like even Warner Brothers is yeah, basically Warner Brothers definitely. yeah Warner Brothers is basically bowing down to his demands to release Tenet in theaters, even though it'd be far easier to just put it up on streaming. And they gave him what two hundred million dollars for it. Like yeah, the, um, he's got a loud voice too. 
I think there was something where like he gets like a third or like a fourth of opening weekend ticket sales revenue, oh. and it's like that's ridiculous. <laughs> that is a lot. That's yeah. so much money. No, oh no wonder God. he wants it to open in fucking theaters. <laughs> <laughs> But also, yeah, like, let's save this one. Let's, uh, you probably you can get a third of the HBO Max revenue, zero dollars and zero cents. Hey, and hey, boom. there'll be like three people that jump on just to watch Tenant. I would be one of those three. Yeah, I was going to say, I would, I would definitely start my free trial on HBO Max <laughs> and then try and get through like an entire TV show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's... I, I do feel too... It, it it's really I, I think a necessary thing for Nolan to push back Tenet because if his last few films have been anything uh, to uh, set a trend, it's that it's going to perform much better in a theater than it is at home. Yeah. Dunkirk. Dunkirk. <clears throat> Dunkirk did Dunkirk <throat> fantastic and okay not not in that sense but I didn't Dunkirk did do fantastic at the box office. I mean, yeah, we'll talk about it in a future podcast, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, we will eventually cover Dunkirk. <laughs> yes. As if it's already been recorded. And it's just sitting now. I I am almost certain. Yeah, imagine how inconvenient it, it would be if we recorded, like, a Nolan episode and then Tenet got delayed and then our schedule got changed and then that podcast is going to be released later. I feel like that would be really inconvenient for us, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah that, would, that would suck. Uh, but luckily, yeah. we haven't recorded anything, right, guys? Yeah, luckily. Oh, no, absolutely not. Yeah, Who's nothing. Christopher Nolan? <laughs> exactly. I haven't seen a single one of the man's films. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting tonight with Interstellar. I will say, actually, now that I think about it, I think I the first... Christopher Nolan movie I saw in theaters was Interstellar and then Dunkirk and those are the only two. I don't think I've seen any of his other movies in theaters. No, I don't I think, think about I've it. seen any of his movies that, in yeah, theaters. Yeah, no, that's actually fair. I, oh, except I, Dunkirk, I saw Inception Dunkirk. in theater. I saw, no. I saw I have not. Inception, Dunkirk, and Interstellar in theaters. And uh, the first one was good. <laughs> <laughs> Which you actually didn't like from your theater experience, as you said. I, I, I like the movie theater experience for Dunkirk, but. Uh, we, oh, I was, I was we, referring we, to we Inception. Will... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't like it coming out of it I, I, the first time, but it, you know what? I feel like we'll get to that in a future episode. I feel Very I feel nice. like we'll discuss this in depth. Do we do we want to talk about Thunder Road a little bit, like, and then maybe like put it you know more towards the beginning? Because I'd love to talk about yeah. Thunder Road a little. Because I, mean, I feel like sure, we just kind of jumped can. off of that I, and I, didn't. I think part of the reason we branched off of it is because you know we're we're all pretty much in agreement that it's a good movie. I think. Sure. I just, want, I just want to talk about like a few scenes, then we can like cut it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I, I think I praise it a little yeah. bit less than you guys, honestly. Like you seem to hold it as if it's like a perfect film, and I'm like, well, yeah. I'm not gonna lie. I rewatched it last night, and I just put it on my uh, letterbox favorite films page because fuck yeah. it, it's that good. I, I don't know. I, I think it's very good, and I think it's especially like stunning what he did with no budget. But at the same time, you know. Yeah, it, it it it's very. I mean, good, what what is what think... is a legitimate like significant flaw with this film? <sighs> Give me a second on that. Yeah, go, go... <laughs> That's exactly what I'm fucking talking about. No, no, about. go go go, like talk a little bit more. Give me a second to just sit here and think, for a moment. Uh, continue. Uh, yeah, I got, no, I, got continue. I got I got I got a few scenes I want to talk about. I I brought up the scene. I guess spoilers. Is that okay with you guys? No. Yeah. Absolutely. No. <laughs> I think we've, yeah, we've, we've seen the movie, the movie twice, now. so please don't. So yeah, um, spoilers for Thunder Road from here on out. Um, the song. The song. Yeah. Only the song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he says. He says. Uh, oh. 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 Take my hand. So the scene. <laughs> You're scene. done. Stop. Right. It is right. over. So yeah, the scene. A few scenes I want to bring up. I mentioned briefly the scene where, like, um, he's just at home and then his friend comes over and they just kind of, like, drink, chat, smoke cigars. I really, really love that scene. We're also before that scene, he's talking about how um, he wanted to <laughs> build a swimming pool in the backyard so that, you know, his daughter, when she gets to high school, eventually she could throw a party and bring over her friends. And, you know, she'd probably, like, sneak them over or something, but he'd know. And... She'd act like, you know, he didn't know, and he'd just be like, oh, no, it's, you know, nothing happened, but he would know, and, you know, he would 
purposely make some extra food and leave it in the fridge or whatever, like, you know, just so that she and her friends could have a good time. I just, that was, that was one of the saddest things I've seen in a long time, was that scene. Yeah. I also love the build up to that scene too, where he just walks into the house and everything is just overturned and destroyed. And he walks upstairs and finds him and he's got a cigarette in his hand and the whole movie he's been taking nicotine gum as a way mm-hmm. to they never like describe it or anything. It's all visual, but he's been doing it so that he can be a better father and he can stop smoking. And like that like just one little shot and some production design just shows how broken he is which is like a great example of like a writer who understands how to tell things visually in addition to just regular dialogue there was never a line of oh you're smoking again yeah <laughs> yep. just yeah, that would be horrible it would be so bad <laughs> yeah but like, also in fairness i think it, a like, lot of people would physically yeah. i think a lot of like student filmmakers especially as i and i are student filmmakers um, a lot of people do that. I struggle with that, actually. Yeah, honestly. I, I, like pers- <laughs> I personally struggle with it. Like, that's why I and I work together, so we can call each other out on it and, yeah. like, put it to bed. But, it's yeah. It's very, very well done visual storytelling. And for as wordy as this movie is, like, there's a, just, there are many scenes of Jim Cummings just, like, spewing dialogue. Well, not even spewing, because it's really well written. But just, like just you know delivering line upon line or a monologue it's a very restrained movie i think yeah and even his dialogue delivery like his dialogue delivery is very his whole performance is really good his dialogue delivery is good but even so um it's one of those movies where i feel like you could watch it more or less on mute and still figure out everything that's happening Mm -hmm. um and it doesn't feel overacted even with that um which just shows well, it helps that it's a very dramatic film, so I, I was gonna, you can be a bit okay. larger, but yeah. Here, Here's some criticism. It, one, I disagree that it's not overacted. I think I think it's very much overacted. Like, as in, he, he has a very specific style of acting, and or like this kind of comedy thing, where I mentioned it at the beginning, uh, where it's... I'm breaking it up. I, I'm breaking up. I'm falling apart. Uh, should we call the warranty or call the manufacturer? It like you know, jump over to something that's like a non-important detail. That's just like, I'm just taking a second out and like recomposing. I mean that, that is then, the character. Yeah, it, it's part of the character. Okay, but I mean essentially it's it's a gag that he does. It's a continuing gag throughout the movie, it, and it it works at the beginning and then after that it it just kind of falls off it loses its effectivity because it's throughout the entire fucking movie it's every well, line that's he a fundamental point of his character he can't uh, really the, like especially when he is under the, like under stress he can't really focus on anything. the entire movie is basically just uh, stringing together a uh, monologue to monologue to monologue but I, I also explained how like you know there's a lot of talking but it is also a lot of visual storytelling the, where... there is a lot of visual storytelling but it it is a, no, I mean, it's I fundamentally it's disagree that show. it's a gag because, well, I mean, it is a one-man show, but that's not criticism. No, it's not no, a gag but... because, like, he has dyslexia and his whole character is dyslexia spread over his whole character, pretty much. That is just what he is. He can't focus on anything and he is falling apart. Did he, does that he is what the movie is about. Because I feel like maybe he said that, but I don't remember. Oh, I don't remember what? him saying that. Impossibly. What did you say? I was saying, did he? Did his character ever say he had ADHD? I know it was definitely he had dyslexia because he had this whole thing about how his mom used to like read his textbooks and all that. On yeah, TV. no. He, and his daughter also ADHD. had problems. I, I just didn't remember. I was just asking, but but no, I mean it's it it, it it's that basically it, it, it's just stringing together like the it, it feels like a bun a couple of like short films in the style of the original thunder road like short thing where it's just let's set up a camera that that's mostly still or might you a slow pan out while we're just having him do a monologue and be wacky it's the style of like the thing is that's the whole movie you're saying this is the style of the movie and somehow it's criticism like you're not stating an issue you're stating an objective fact about the movie and like say what you want like you know it is like you know a lot of like you know still shots or like painting but like it does exactly what it has to 
and like that is the I, best way to shoot that scene. The, the <laughs> like if you if you, if you don't like, like that, that's so the the part, I guess you could go for What it, makes but. it a criticism? What makes it a criticism is that it's it, like you're saying it's just a styled movie, but it 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 loses effectivity. Like the more you the more monologues you put into a film, the less you care about any one of those monologues. I mean, right? I, I disagree because, like, I mean, the another movie I'm going to bring up, okay, The Lighthouse is nonstop Sorry. monologues. <laughs> the Lighthouse is literally nonstop monologues, and yeah, I don't you, think that affects the most movie of, negatively But most of those all. monologues, you don't care about anything that the character is actually saying. You're just caring about watching Willem Dafoe lose his mind. I, uh, I'd like to bring up Shakespeare as an example here. Yeah. yeah. Just all of Shakespeare's work is a lot of... Having performed Shakespeare, it's a lot of monologues. Like that's just how he writes. Gr- granted, but that's spread out about, over it's five about hours. The build. Yeah, that, that's it's, spread out over like five hours and three acts, not an hour and thirty minutes where it's monologue after monologue after monologue after monologue. How does that make it? Well, better. when you're compressing, <laughs> like how would how would having less monologues and shorter time make it worse? What what <laughs> the no, monologues were well written. It, it gives it's you not good the insight le- on his character, and it feels it's natural. not it's so not like, less. I, it, no, and once again, I'll reiterate. I think it's a great film. I don't think it's a perfect film like you guys seem to be claiming. I don't think it's a perfect film either. Like there are yeah. obviously problems. I think, it gets, I think it gets way too. I don't want to yeah, join way too this much, gangbang, but like what? the only, I'm saying I don't want to join like the gangbang that is going on right now. But um, I I feel like the only way I could legitimately answer such like such a critique from you is through a subjective experience of mine with the movie because we're arguing about whether or not something was effective i I suppose so and i will say that um i didn't really care both the first and the second watch which the second watch happened like last night i didn't really care for the character that much in the first like third of the movie maybe the first quarter of the movie until we get the first interaction with the daughter before then, um, like, I, I felt pity, but I didn't emphasize necessarily. I guess mm-hmm. um, that repeating, like, as you call it, gag worked for me. Ever Like, with every, it only worked at an exponential. Like, the more I saw um, that man go through hardships and how, like, pre-built he was to just never react to those harsh realities in the proper way the more it broke my heart like i think the whole movie is built like on really an exponential as i already said trajection of just tragedy over tragedy over tragedy and once again spoiler alert by the end he kind of gets gets his win even though it's a very bittersweet well, okay that's another one is, is that the win the win doesn't really make sense is that it? Like they give him the okay, way. Okay, we'll, we'll move on to that. But you do understand okay. what I'm saying, though, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I under I understand what you're what you're trying to say, but like that, the uh, it works in a dramatic sense. But this com or this film is also billed as a comedy. In the comedy aspect, I disagree with doesn't it. Work. No, the it's not built as a really comedy. Funny. No, it, it it's funny, but it's not built as a comedy. Every it, movie, funny. as I said in the, no, every it is movie, built. as I said in the beginning no. of this podcast. I, I has said, well, humor nowadays. I, I said big build. production or build, small production. B B I L L E D. Build, so yeah. sold as a comedy, and as a okay. comedy, I don't. Okay. It doesn't work at all. I just. I mean, like there, there are cause... there are funny moments. It, there's cringe humor at the beginning, and then at, and then there's a couple of moments where it's like particularly cringy throughout. I think you it's know, endearing humor, but even then, like, well, uh, where when is I say this cringe, movie sold as a comedy? Like, when I say cringe, that's my what? question. It's not what? constructed as a comedy. When I watched it, I never experienced it as a comedy. Like, where is that even coming? Well, from? okay, that that brings us back to like the whole it comes it comes at night argument, where it's like, you know, it's a great film on its own. I think Andrew disagrees, uh, nice. but <laughs> sorry, uh, but it was billed as a horror movie, and as a horror movie, it fucking sucks. Well, the difference between it comes at night and. Uh, Thunder Road is that It Comes at Night actually had a yeah, directed marketed campaign yeah. which Thunder Road didn't so I don't see what like I mean, you how can... a non-existent ad campaign and yeah. non-existent billing gave I, I you a wrong say, impression pull, pull it up... just doesn't make sense to me uh, I'll, I'll give you an example P- 
pull up just the poster for, or like, you know, the cover art type thing. So just look For Thunder up, Road? Yeah, Thunder Road movie. I mean, like, when you say that it's a comedy, like, I know the poster is comedic, but, like... Yeah. It is... It, it reminds me, in many ways, it is less comedic than this movie, but it kind of reminds me of Groundhog's Day, I think. A little bit. Yeah. Where, like, is Groundhog's Day funny? Yeah, absolutely. It's really funny, but it's a very dry comedy with, like, occasional yeah, moments no, of, like, Bill me. Murray being, like, insane. I, but... I love dry comedy. Like, for instance, I, I've referenced throughout this episode a couple of times, The Lobster. The Lobster is 100% dry comedy. But this... There's basically, there's one type of comedy in this movie, and it's, oh, he can't, like, oh, he really misspoke there. Okay, no, that is, that is objectively false. Well, what Just other think type back, of comedy? Think back, think back to like the moment where he plays. I feel like you're making a lot of straw No, okay, I finish, I finish. Let me, no, let what, me finish, what other please. type of comedy is there? Yeah, I'm gonna tell you if everybody stops interrupting me, thanks. Um, I'm sorry about being a bitch. It's but... Okay. Um, the scene where he, uh, before he takes his daughter to school in like the first, I think, third of the film, um, in, at night they play like the clapping game, whatever, and he completely sucks at it. And then she goes to bed, um, like the whole, I love you where she doesn't say it back scene. Then the morning she wakes up, they play the game. He's really good at it. She leaves and you see him take the, the paper with like the hands drawn on it off the wall. And that is endearing humor. That's absolutely not cringe humor. There, and I think no, endearing humor is actually the number one. No, it is comedy. There's not a... Co- there, no, it's no, not comedy that's, at all. No, when we watched that movie, it, like, once again, we watched it together. Einish, uh, Andrew, and I. I know it was funny to me. I remember Einish chuckling when that happened. I thought like, it was pretty I, sweet. I remember that very clearly. It's funny and also, is, like... It's a different style of comedy. It's endearing comedy, which is actually the number one type of laughs that this movie is in fact the goal there's also for. the uh the uh, parent teacher conference scene which oh, is that seems hilarious yeah it's really funny <laughs> <laughs> but it's also like sad because like you know he's essentially okay. breaking down I mean, well it's sort of like also i pulled maybe it's up objective but i, I pulled I really up the poster laugh a single time throughout this movie okay. you also watched it at, like four that is that is very subjective <laughs> no like i, like I, I mean said, this i like is subjective it. but yeah. i like, subjective and, as fuck and, also, in all fairness, like, Alex did watch this last night. Like, I personally, I normally take a few days before I really kind of figure out how I feel about a movie. So, like, I don't know. Like, things may change. May no, know. And you once again, know. let me restate. No, I, I, know, I know you the, think it's I, great. I yeah, love I the movie. I think it's a great movie. But, you know, you guys are jerking it off a whole lot. And I don't think it deserves quite so much, like, well, oh, okay, this the is... Reason- this is the reason amazing. I, I could, can do I like could bring this. up the negatives. Which this I is the I best movie of all time. Okay, like, personally, no, the reason the reason I am attacking you right now not, is because but... I like I asked you. I think this movie is great. I think there are very few flaws, if any. So when you said there are a bunch, I asked you to bring them up. You brought did, them up. Did I say a bunch? And to me, I, no, I don't he didn't think say I said a bunch. He just said he said there's some. Yeah, which I, I said agree there with are flaws. As well, well okay, so I I offered you to like bring 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 some up. And so far, you have only brought stuff up that was either incorrect or very subjective. Uh, I okay. When is so the point before about the monologues? Like, in Andrew asked, "Well, why is it less effective to have a bunch of monologues in a short time versus a bunch of monologues spread out over a long time?" Also, the monologues are not back to back to back. Like, I feel like they, you're almost claiming that they are, but it's like every they're fifteen minutes or so. They're fairly fucking frequent. Okay, think. How many monologues are there in this film? I mean, there's a bunch. There's a bunch. Yeah, and then I can think, think of, of like how long each five. monologue. Think of how many how long each monologue goes on. The only big ones I can think of are right. the, the. The only big ones I can think of are the beginning, the breakdown at the police police the precinct, and the uh, ending monologue to his wife. And like there are yeah, other think... smaller monologues yeah, throughout no, the film, they're... but those are the three big ones. And also, like they're... before before you respond to add on to this point, I think personally that the strongest um tangent he goes on is actually the one in the parking lot, personally. I agree. After that, he's being fired from like the police. <laughs> and I think that just uh, that's another showcase of the fact that these monologues don't really muddle each other out, but instead it's a progressive, like exponential build up to the complete collapse of this character they it, it, essentially the the problem is that if you 
the uh, the uh, viewer or the audience only has so much uh i'm trying to figure out how to say it but like it's the monologue is a, a thing of stress relief right uh and not so necessarily it okay but it it is a crescendo mo- moment it is the crescendo all the time in this in this movie yes it is no, I, like... i've never seen a monologue that's not the crescendo of the scene never even in shakespeare it's always the crescendo I mean, okay, sure. Let's let's roll with this. Okay. Twelfth uh, night is arguable, but <laughs> yeah, okay. in general, I, I don't I, think I, in I've general, seen I'd say you're right. Night. Yeah, yeah, it's Twelfth the crescendo, night. and so basically, in this in this movie, you get crescendo, 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 and you're like, it works in Shakespeare because it's spread out over five hours, and so it's like an opera. You can crescendo several times in an opera because it's fucking five hours long it's eternal right so you you can build a whole piece up right and so that's why normally movies only really contain one monologue like the the my my issue with this is very much an issue i have with lighthouse which is that um lighthouse i I enjoyed the monologues you're you're on thin ice young man i enjoy yeah i enjoy the monologues for watching them and just being entertained because it's Willem Dafoe being kooky and weird, and I fucking love that because I love Willem Dafoe. But most of the monologues in that film, like, you don't care about what they're saying, and at a certain point, you stop caring, really, about the plot, and it's just about, I want to see Willem Dafoe be crazy. I mean, that is, that has not been my That's experience with The much Lighthouse the at all. Movie. However, like, this is not a conversation about The Lighthouse, anywho. So, Fair. like, let's... Uh, all I'm gonna say about the lighthouse is that it's not my experience with Thunder Road, though. Like, I completely understand if, like, as you said, the continuous crescendo of this film didn't work for you, and I don't think that's something that I would ever like blame you over or say like your taste is wrong. You're wrong about this <laughs> film. But like, stating that this film a continuous crescendo, which it really is, as I said, it is. It's an exponential buildup of this one character's complete collapse. But that's not like. You never mention anything that is actually bad about it. Like, you state a fact, okay, you, and, you, like, in the movie, if it's bad, there will be some sort of an indication that it's bad. The, but you're it, just it, saying, it's, it's the movie did it, writing, and it's bad. It, no, it, it's basic writing that you... There's a reason it's called a fucking crescendo. It's because you've, you've built up to it, and it's the peak point. I mean, point. You, okay, you call it a crescendo, I can call it a slow, steady crawl. Like, I mean, that's just, we're throwing around words. Like that doesn't no, change okay. what the so, film no, actually it's, is. It's like, like I said, it's it, so the crescendo is that peak point, that peak point in tension and stress and all of that stuff. So, well, um, actually, no, not necessarily. Crescendo is the process of rising. It's not the peak itself. Uh, okay, I'm I'm using the the like musical term crescendo as in which, like which I am doing as well. You're just okay. using it. Well, when you when you okay, once again, when when you're talking about the crescendo of a piece or of a movement you're talking about that point the upwards movement that's yes, the crescendo that the increase in volume movement, that upwards movement is it, it's pretty universally understood you guys to be are that arguing on the crescendo point. yeah yeah i know okay but well, it's... i mean in all fairness i'm not the person taking the argument there he, like i'm just saying that's not but, what the crescendo is okay i'm giving, I'm giving you guys three minutes to figure this okay. out the crescendo <laughs> the crescendo is basically you you put it there to create this big i think you're thinking about of tension. hold on you're building up the tension and then at the end of the crescendo it's the release of tension it is the like you have built it all the way up and then you release that is what the crescendo is in every piece and then after that it's wrapping things up it's returning to forms well, and stuff you see the issue this movie is... just keeps crescendoing for an hour and a half and you the can't issue is you that can't crescendo that long. <coughs> alien oh wait what okay. oh, you, you don't you don't have to scream sorry at me if that. it's not gonna make <clears throat> your the issue is that indeed crescendo does imply progression upwards and it's perfect like i'm not devaluing you i think it's perfectly okay to prefer crescendo where it after that gradually goes on the like downslide into a gradual decrease however nowhere even if you want to make this like definitional which i don't think is a valid approach to take in this argument crescendo on its own does not imply a following diminuendo 
Like that that's just not that no, that's not it, correct. It is, well, actually, really, you you never end on crescendo, but um, the movie the, doesn't end on the crescendo. No, either. no, but and, like, and I'm, that's I'm not. Aware, but, you're just you're just you're throwing saying, around terms. No, but but it, it it's basic fundamentals of writing in that you can't you can't basically make this entire movie just. All right, we start at the top, and we stay at the top, and or of tension and like all that stuff. You just stay there, and then all of a sudden at the end, it all works out in the end. That, okay. That's a, a shit form. So I understand that Andrew and I are a little bit on the sidelines now. So I'm gonna bring this. You guys a have a bit minute and fifteen close. seconds to go. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this to sort of a close. But I will say that like. Ten. Um, you are continuously saying that this movie is a crescendo and that is like a basic flaw of writing like you can't do that like fundamentally in writing that is wrong well no but, it, it's not okay. it's not that it's no, just that is, that is that, what you're saying and the no, it, like and, the prime and perhaps I'm explaining it poorly but it, it's the idea it, the, thank you um, the idea is that it. what do you use raising tension for you it, it, and i go over i talk about this for like very briefly in my horror series but which i will return to don't worry audience i'm coming back um but the you it's about increasing tension and then releasing tension increasing releasing and you you build up gradually you build up with increments and then you, you know you go up two steps and then you take one step back because you can't sustain just one keep step 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 okay up i'm gonna without any step, i hear step. i hear what you're saying as, you can't as maintain I said before, that for an hour and a half i'm gonna try to go in the same direction to kind of close this discussion because the real like Two, the three, most valid four. argument against like such um such a position Two, is uh three, says four. fucking who because Your time i could up. just give you an example <laughs> no i could i could give you an example of this movie and i think this movie does <laughs> what you're saying done. is a fundamental yeah, flaw of writing uh, well, I'm finishing off my point. Yeah, go, so. yeah, go thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm going to mute this mic. Thunder, Thunder Road is uh, a movie that does exactly what you're saying is a fundamental flaw of writing. I personally think it doesn't hamper it and it succeeds in it. And it's okay for you to think otherwise. But you have to provide actual like reasoning from within the movie where those flaws are showcased. Because if you're saying that... Well, of course that's bad because that's a fundamental flaw of writing. That's just a fallacy in your argument no, called it, it, who it's, it's fucking that said that. It's that you can't sustain tension for an hour and a half. You can't where just sustain. Where is that shown in the film? Oh my fucking god! You Give can't... me an example it, it, of a scene where that is clearly showcased in the film that the tension is lacking. To, to sustain, to sustain. T- Alex said no, fucking but who. But even in Alien, you keep said you keep who. releasing tension in Alien. <laughs> You can't because because humans aren't capable of being that tense for that long. Alex, we you aren't can't, capable of it. That's not how you construct an argument. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Do you know, because do you know how tension works? Tension comes from the basic, like it, it comes from survival instincts, right? Okay, that's we're where so tension far comes from. The argument. No, but that's where tension comes from. Is tension is is an evolutionary instinct. And it, it is Alex. It, it it is tension is there to make us so that we can be more aware of predators coming in at any moment, and so we get those moments of high tension, but we can't sustain tension for an hour and a half. You can't keep adrenaline pumping for an hour and a half. You just can't. I we're don't not capable. We're not exactly physically capable. Same. We don't. The more you, Alex, the more you, you don't have cortisol you're not gonna that lasts that argument long. By shouting, and the more you shout, the more you discredit yourself. That's all you're achieving. So chill. No, be, First well, of all, you, horror yeah. tension doesn't work in the same way as tension in this film because it's not about keeping you scared and like not knowing what is in there, which is usually the tension of what like horror is based on in various like general um, normal terms. But once again, the even thing. if Albert Einstein, even if uh, Albert Einstein told me right now that that's a fundamental like b- basic principle of writing. I would say says fucking who because an appeal to authority is never a good argument to make that critique work you need to find a moment or a scene in the movie which shouldn't be that hard if it's a fundamental flaw of writing where you can clearly see that the tension is ineffective or it doesn't work or it doesn't sustain which you're not doing you're you just like 
When I tell you that, you just start screaming the same things no, just louder. Well, like because, that's not an because I, 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 I'm, I'm literally explaining to you that even if physically, Albert fucking we are Einstein physically told me that oh my physically God, incapable of maintaining like, tension for that long. F hu human beings are not capable, physically capable. It's not. It's not a personal opinion. It's scientific. It's medical fact. We are not capable of maintaining well, adrenal okay, or cortisol rushes for that fucking long. We can't. That's just a fact. Once again, you don't need to scream. I'm not screaming. I, okay, I moved Alex, closer to the Alex, mic. Unlike, unlike the movies, you unfortunately can't sustain that amount of tension, so please chill. I will say that, as I said before, this movie does not exercise the same type of tension as a horror film. Because it is fundamentally different. It's yeah. not based on our fear. I, I'm, I'm aware. It's not based on our I'm fear aware of the unknown. that it's not the same type of tension. It plays on how we emphasize with the character. I'm it's aware it's not the different. same type of tension. But still, tension does come from the same fucking, uh, the same hormones, right? It comes from cortisone. It comes from adrenaline. Uh, it, or really, cortisone is just a type of kind of adrenal. Uh, uh, okay, can I ask you a yes or no can question? I, can I jump in here a little bit? Yes. Sick. So, I still want to ask Alex a yes or no question, but okay. Uh, should I go then, or should yeah, I wait for yeah. you? Okay. Is, it, is it something cool. that's going to finish this argument up? or Kind of. Hopefully. Then I'm going to first hopefully. ask this yes or no question. First. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Rip. I'm sorry. Um, if this movie, as you say, fails on a basic premise of a fundamental rule of right in writing, it should be, then, fairly easy to find like indications of that flaw in how the movie doesn't work in certain scenes is that a yes or a no no well then your That's argument no. is just uh rhetorics uh no i don't think so because it the it, so certain things are very you do obvious. understand that an certain, appeal to authority stop, is stop, not a good argument no, right? no guys can certain we have things Andrew say what he was going to say because like how, well however oleg we'll you, just well, like just hold on just like just like oleg when we were arguing about the monty hall python or uh, monty, monty hall problem <laughs> i'm an idiot yeah, the <laughs> monty hall concept. problem you really like our audience you, you, doesn't even know that argument I, I'm, I'm aware i'm aware but you and I had a, uh, an argument you about really the Monty. You really need to ch chill stop. before you stay. Stop. Oh my God. Monty Hall. We we had an argument about the Monty no, Hall I was problem. Wrong. Yeah. Would you stop for a second and let me speak? I um, speak. We had an argument about the Monty Hall uh, problem, and you kept saying, "Well, you can't point to like you know, uh, the quantum physics. You know, you can't point to like these statistics things." Because it's an appeal to authority. Because I don't know the facts behind it, right? So you're 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 trying to devalue the idea of basic medical fact that we're that we're physically, physically incapable of sustaining cortisone rushes for that fucking long. We can't do it. Okay, it's it, it's I will medical say you are facts. misrepresenting my argument completely. Hi like, guys. That is not at all what I said. Hello. Okay. No, I mean, Andrew. Andrew, be, Andrew, what do you have to say? Hi. No, I will say you <laughs> no. will be. No. Anyway. Let me speak. I'm giving up, Andrew. Andrew, no, Andrew. This will be cut out anyway. But oh, I'm not going to. Major cut. No, we're keeping it in. No, and we're running out of start, time. So the moment you start Andrew, talking about the what? Monty Hall problem, it's going to be cut out because like our audience doesn't even know what you're referring to. No, well, no. But my but, argument there hi was guys. that an appeal yeah, to Andrew, authority. Andrew, hop support. in here. No. Thank you. Oh, yes, like, so, shut the fuck up uh, and let Andrew go so that okay, we can no. close this because I no, have 10 Alex, minutes. Look, you oh, have been screaming at me for way longer than I've been making my point. I've been civil with you, so don't please shut my mouth now. That's just not fair. I'm saying is you are completely misrepresenting my point because my point there was the same as it is here which despite me being wrong there was completely valid because i said that an appeal to authority is a shitty argument because what you need to do is you need to actually explain to me why you're right and not yeah. say well quantum physics says i'm right no, therefore and, i'm and, automatically and like right. i explained to you there just because you don't have access to a knowledge base does not make that knowledge base invalid. So what because knowledge base do I not have access to when we're talking about physics, a movie Thunder okay. Road? And like I just explained to you, like you you apparently are not aware of the medical effects of, of, of cortisone, of how stress works in our body. 
of how tension Bro, works we in got our body. Nine minutes. Can, can, yeah. can, we, can we just wrap? I mean, okay. I already explained and... to you why this tension is different from horror tension. I guess no, Andrew no, can take it No, no. But that's away. well. There, yeah, there's no, a lot of actually. That's stress, what I'm going to say. That's what I was going to talk about. Is actually horror and comedy work in very very similar ways. They're both about building up tension and then releasing that tension. Mm-hmm. That's how comedy works. That's how horror works. That's why a lot of mm-hmm. uh, comedy directors and horror directors kind of switch back and forth. And um, yeah, Jordan I mean, Peele. I think and it's it's worth noting too that oh. like this, both this Thunder Road, which is very much a drama, and Lighthouse, which is pretty much a horror atmosphere, were both structured or like the directors and writers both came out and said that they structured them as comedies. So like. Maybe the films don't necessarily seem that that's what they're going for, but that is, like, how the artist went out making them. So, I mean, I guess it's kind of interesting that you have these two films that are pretty different in a lot of ways, but also kind of similar, like we've been talking about with the monologue structures and things like that. And, yeah, I mean, I guess that's that's really kind of all I had to say there is that the tension aspect is is quite true. I do think that both of these films have moments where they kind of let the tension relax a little bit and lighthouse some of its like fart jokes here it's more or less like the smaller moments maybe when he's driving things like that um like even alien which i think is an incredibly tense film has those kinds of moments when it's just like ripley you know joking around with the crew things like that or like the crew like kind of playing games on her like there's 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 always some moments, but like here in Thunder Road and like in Alien and like Lighthouse, they're just kind of small and few between, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It makes the film more tense, but also that's that's up to you whether you get invested with this or not. I agree. That's one of the flaws of the film is that you don't really get into them until the daughter comes into the picture, and also I think that the ending, like the whole third act, is a bit too rushed for its own good. Um, the events make sense. Mm-hmm. They just needed a bit more time to gestate, in my opinion. But, yeah. Overall, I think the tension building here does work really well. And I think the film... If the film... I agree with Alex. If the film was all monologues, then it wouldn't work. But I do think there is more to it than that. I think there's enough quiet, non-talking moments to make it work. Yeah, um, thank you for saying that. I will say that was surprisingly, <laughs> that was a nice turn in the conversation for, <laughs> for the better. Yeah, but a nice I medial. Do, I, yeah, I do want to say, it, it, not as an argument, but as like a, a point of reconciliation <laughs> more than anything, <laughs> that I never devalued any sort of opinion on Thunder Road. I said that you can think whatever you want to think because art is like principally subjective. So any opinion... As long, like, as long as a subjective opinion is absolutely valid. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I appreciate that, and thank you for also trying to reconcile. Uh, I'll say the same. I'm not trying to devalue you, get your guys's uh, point of really loving the film. Obviously, that's a great thing, um, and I think the film is great too and deserves a high amount of praise. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, my opinion is that it. Sorry. <coughs> Apologies. <clears throat> oh no. It it it's that. Yeah, no. <laughs> through my throat. Um, um, Thank God. We're I'll, I'll wrap it up word. since I'm almost here. Um. Yeah. No. So basically, the there there is always subjectivity in film, obviously, or in in art in general. But I think that there are certain underlying values which are constants. Certain things that you can do to immediately improve art or to deprove art right like you can immediately depreciate a piece of art by burning it um and they said well it depends on if you really like the look of the flames you might really think it's a great piece of art. well no it's you've just set the painting on fire you know it, it's yeah it's sort of like you can say that like if someone lights a scene so that you can't see the person's face <laughs> Mm-hmm. And like they're supposed, it's like a five minute like yeah, it's big delivery, and you can't yeah. see them. They're like it's shrouded in mystery. It's like no, they just suck at lighting. <laughs> I mean, unless it is actually intentional, 
Yeah, like, I mean, it there can, are moments. I mean, there are moments in film that when there, that there are moments where you like, can is be legitimately used and to be effect. intentionally bad. Like, like think yeah. about like Michael Bay, for example. Like Michael Bay is very <laughs> intentional about yeah. most everything he does. He's just very not good at it. Yeah, he but, very like, intentionally put in a swinging. Yeah. I mean, swinging gas t- canister. The testicles. only the <laughs> only reason I had issue with your example of like not lighting someone's face is because it's such a common technique used in cinema that is very often used to effect without. The lighting being bad so i was just like oh wait yeah. no but not for like a long delivery either that's for like an introduction i mean like i guess it's like word. very context based yeah, yeah yeah it's also more noir than anything yeah. oh, Maybe right. um i i really have to go in a couple of minutes uh yeah. I, and let's wrap it up i know you have your your thoughts yeah i wanted to i just wanted to wrap with i think like the ending of the movie because i think the ending's great i personally i thought it was a very effective ending and it is a bit rushed like how andrew and he was saying but i do kind of like how everything kind of wraps back at the end where like he was this whole time trying to like clean up his mother's dance academy and like get that started but obviously that went nowhere and then all that but then he found a way to connect with his daughter at the end with the dancing they go to see the ballet and his daughter obviously is just very inspired stands up and he you get that fantastic ending shot just on his face (laughs) as he kind of just starts crying and smiling i just I just wanted to, I guess, sing the praises of that ending. Yeah. Yeah, I love that ending, too. Yeah, and I will say one final thing for this is that, like, a lot of times, you know, people who are, like, big fan, like, critics get called out for being, like, pretentious because they love all these low-budget movies more than the big-budget stuff, which I love big-budget stuff, so it kind of bothers me, too. Like, I think it's mm-hmm. kind of short setting those, but... Like, we were talking last night, like, big budget movies, big spectacles. Ever since the 1950s and the birth of television, big spectacles have been a staple of Hollywood filmmaking. So it's a lot easier to greenlight a big budget movie that'll be bad. But if you get a movie like Thunder Road that finally gets out and gets recognized, it has to be pretty good because otherwise it wouldn't get this far. Mm -hmm. People would stop it. And so most, like, movies like Thunder Road are bad. You just never see them because they don't go anywhere. So I think it's just nice to have movies like Thunder Road that are so good that they're able to make it out, like a Little Miss Sunshine sort of mm-hmm. example. A and, sleeper hit that just kind of yeah. swings in because of how well it's made. Yeah, and it might hopefully, if like the other low budget movies we discussed, hopefully we're seeing the birth of a new really good auteur. So there's that. <laughs>